recorded in Chicago, Illinois, with your hosts, Ken, Matt, Neil, and Jeff. This is Triviality. The cream of the crop. Hello and welcome to Triviality, the game where a lack of seriousness meets a little bit of knowledge. My name is Neil and I'm in an empty studio as per usual uh, during the uh, current uh, current time, but I'm joined over Skype uh, with Matt and Jeff. Let's start with Matt. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. And I think at this point, you just prefer being by yourself in that studio anyway. You, I, I think you removed the chairs. And it's just... Yeah, I did. I moved the TV. I moved the chairs. Um, <laughs> it, it's sort of become a, a little hole in the wall that I can hang out in and record. So I do enjoy it. That's true. <laughs> a little isolation. A little Yeah, a little isolation within isolation. It's uh, a lot of isolation, if we're being honest. It but, is. Hey, there's I mean, Jeff. He's here, yeah, too. Yeah, I am here. Um, you know, we, all, we all know how Neil is. I think that's why he keeps so ambitiously calling it the new normal because he's hoping that he never has to like interact with a person again yeah, right. in, in the meat space as, it, as we call it. So, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. If I can just talk to a wall um, in solitary, but have a microphone, I'm sure I'd be happy. It's just like me when I performed at weddings, as long if you gave me the microphone, I would not stop until you kicked me out. So that I believe. Yes. <laughs> Where's Ken? No Ken today, huh? No, Ken actually, uh, I mean, he's doing something noble, which I appreciate. So um, if you're familiar with Barney Almond Butter, it's a great almond butter you can get. And uh, they're based in Fresno, California, and they needed some extra hands. And uh, Ken went there with his sleeveless uh, metal shirts, and uh, he's he's physically squeezing almonds to get the essence and the almond butter out of the almonds with his biceps. So that's what he's doing today. So good on him. I thought it was because he was a world-class churner. Well, he also churns butter, but uh, he's he's on almond butter duty right now. So he's just squeezing almonds, basically. That's what he's doing today. <laughs> Fresh squeezed almonds. Yes. Mm. All right. Well, we have two very special guests with us today over Skype. Uh, one is going to be a host, and we'll get to uh, her in a minute. But our special guest contestant today uh, is someone that we had a pleasure of meeting at Geek Bowl. Uh, and uh, they are uh, someone that we've wanted to have on the show for quite a long time. Uh, they live in Chicago as well, but we couldn't have them in the studio. Uh, but Skype is the next best thing. So we'd like to introduce Nicole Newlis. Thank you for joining us today. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you've been up to? Sure. My name is Nicole Newlis. I live in Chicago. It was so good having Geek Bowl in Chicago because that was actually my first time going to a big trivia event. I've been listening to Triviality and some other trivia podcasts for a year and a half, coming up on two years now. And I've been pub quizzing basically since I was old enough to get into pubs. But <laughs> I finally made it to my first Geek Bowl and it was amazing. And then it also gave me a bit of whiplash because in the course of less than a week, I go from, yay, Geek Bowl to... I'm not a homebody, but I have to shelter in place. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah, not a whole lot that's been going on in a sense over the last few months. Just, I mean, a lot going on in the world, a lot of staying at home except for trips to the grocery store going on in my life. Things are starting to kind of open back up again, which is good because I'm a horse racing writer and horse racing podcaster mm -hmm. and I'm starting to have more and more and more that I can actually write about and talk about. So things are getting more interesting. We also have a very special guest host. Uh, she is an author. She's a podcast host uh, for Your Brain on Facts. Uh, it's a really great show. If you haven't had a chance to check it out yet, we uh, very much uh, encourage it. But uh, that is Moxie Labouche. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you for having me on. I'm really excited to host the show today. Uh, and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, here's three fun facts about me, since facts are kind of my thing. Um, I was struck by lightning while milking goats. I had a hypnotoad wedding cake, and I did burlesque for George R. R. Martin as part of the only officially approved Game of Thrones burlesque show. That's incredible. No, I, uh, that's so impressive. I feel like you've done more living than I ever will. So, <laughs> I got one or two good moments in. Uh, and uh, where can people find your show? Well, uh, as soon as you've done, as soon as you finished listening to the entire Triviality back catalog, you can use the same app and search for Your Brain on Facts or check it out over at yourbrainonfacts.com. And if you are not in a position to listen, but you still want to learn, there is the Your Brain on Facts book. Wonderful. Um, well, uh, we're so excited to have both of you here today. 
and I believe, uh, Nicole, we're going to be teammates because you said that you uh, aren't as great at pop culture. Is that right? I didn't say I wasn't as great at pop culture. I said I was completely useless oh, at no. pop culture. <laughs> I was trying to give you a little credit there just in case. I... <laughs> <laughs> but people who know me are going to hear this and they would call me on my lie. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm excited to be your teammate. Uh, we had a great fun at Geek Bowl. Um, so uh, you had a, a great team name, I think, which is uh, you know uh, something that you're very passionate about. So what, what is our team name today? Our team name is going to be Blinkers Off. That's actually, it's my horse racing website, blinkers-off.com. But also it ties in nicely to quiz because you've got to take the blinkers off in order to see all the facts and learn them. Well, let's just hope that uh, I can take my blinkers off because uh, if there's any science questions, I will not be of any help to you. So we'll see how that goes. Well, fortunately, science is one of my wheelhouses. Oh, good. Perfect. Matt and Jeff, you're going to be teammates. Uh, What are you thinking for your name? Me and Jeff were talking. Um, this is mostly in relation to Ken and his editing. Um, didn't really like the uh, the goatee scratching sounds. Um, so we we're going with the realistic goatee scratching noise. And what was the background on that, Moxie? If you watch uh, the Shaun of the Dead DVD, there's a particular subtitle track, which has lots of behind-the-scenes facts, kind of like a pop-up videos kind of thing. And there's one scene where Simon Pegg is, like, stroking his chin in thought, planning, and scheming. And the subtitle says, realistic goatee scratching noises. (laughs) I would love to be that uh, subtitler. That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, all right. Well, uh, I think we're all ready to go. Let's uh, let's get a rules read and see how that sounds. The rules of the game are simple. 20 questions split into two rounds worth 10 points apiece. At halftime, there'll be a special swing round designed by this week's host. After regulation, players will enter the final round with the points that they've accumulated and will have a chance to wager 0 to 30 points on five categorized questions. At the end of the game, someone will be named the cream of the crop. I am the cream, yeah. The cream of the crop. Well, they, they were trying to do their best horse impression, um, the rules guy, but I don't know how it sounded. Uh, Nicole, what's your rating on that? I rate it nay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Perfect answer. Uh, well, uh, Moxie, feel free to take it away, and we are ready to play the game. All righty. Round one, question one. Let me ask you something. New Mexico is the only state to have an official state question. What is it? There's a New Mexico. (laughs) I'll give you a clue. It has to do with their principal agricultural export. All right. That's funny. I'm cool with that. Even if it's wrong, I I like it. So just go for it. We're locked in. Okay. So they're locked in. Uh, Nicole, do you know any crops that come from New Mexico? I'm not too familiar the only thing I can think of that they could grow in New Mexico is cactus, which, you know, it reminds me of my days when I was making a lot of prank calls and just going cactus, cactus, <laughs> cactus. That was it was you? a running, jo- it was a running, jo- <laughs> well, it was either me or anyone else on that prank calling message board, the phone <sighs> losers where it was a running joke. <laughs> um, so what would you ask about a cactus? Hug me. <laughs> yeah, I, let's go with that because I I'm at a complete loss here. All right, so Jeff said Jeff texted me that he believes that chili peppers are their biggest crop, um, and then I asked the question that all people ask of peppers is how many packs of peppers did Peter Piper pick? <laughs> That's our answer. We're wrong. Continue. <laughs> well, you're wrong, but you were on the right track. It is to do with the peppers. The official state question of New Mexico is red or green. Oh, that oh makes sense. wow. Do okay. you want red peppers or green peppers? And the correct answer is Christmas, which mm. means both. Yeah, hatch chilies, which they, uh, if you're ever in uh, Santa Fe in the fall, as I've had the pleasure to be twice, every other block, there's somebody with a big roaster roasting fresh chilies, and it's pretty amazing. Alrighty, question two, power chords on a cello. Heavy metal pairs up better with symphony backing than it has any right to, such as with Metallica's S&M, or Symphony and Metallica, the album where the eponymous band played with the symphony orchestra of what major coastal city? Uh, We both texted each other the same thing at the same time, so I think we can lock in with that answer. Does that sound good, Jeff? Yes. 
Yes, we are locked in. Oh, you're locked in first. All right. Um, well, Nicole and I uh, message each other the same answer, and I'll I'll let uh, Nicole answer it because I I believe we're close at least, or or right. Yeah, exactly. What popped into my head was the symphony orchestra from San Francisco, and that's exactly what Neil had an inkling on as well. So I guess that means we're locking in with San Francisco. We were on the opposite coast, and we locked in with Boston. Metallica played with the symphony orchestra of San Francisco. Mm. Nice. Nice job. I, the only reason I knew that was uh, my friend Phil loves to make fun of uh, Lars, the drummer, um, because he doesn't do a lot of fills or, uh, pun, pun intended, I guess, uh, a lot of different fills <laughs> or, or variety. And uh, I remember watching a video he sent uh, where they were performing with uh, the San Francisco Symphony. So thanks to him making fun of Lars. So that's good. All righty. Question three, float like. Speaking of weird mashups, the king of trash talk, Muhammad Ali, found himself in the comic book world fighting against and then with which superhero when aliens, or at least different aliens, invaded Earth? I'm cool, Matt. Yeah, I think I know this one. We can lock in. Okay. Um, Nicole, I believe it's Superman. I think there was a famous cover with that Superman was kind of flying. And I don't. I think he might have even had boxing gloves on, which doesn't really make sense for Superman. But I believe it's him. I am happy to go with that because I had nothing. Uh, yeah, well, let's let's go for it. Uh, we're going to say uh, the answer is Superman. Yeah, we went with the uh, Jerry Seinfeld favorite, Superman as well. Well, Jor-El would be proud. It is Superman. Good job, Neil. Oh, thank you. It's one of those things where you think you know it, and then I so was second-guessing myself because I'm like, oh, I don't want to get this wrong if this is incorrect. I found the cover, Neil. Oh, you didn't? Yeah. Yep, it's pretty much exactly what you described. Oh, good. I'm glad Superman had boxing gloves on then because that's the, what yeah. was confusing me. <laughs> Though, that's ironically, boxers get more injured since boxing gloves were introduced oh, because wow. you're not limited by what happens to your hands because your hands are sense. partially protected. So you punch harder than people did back when they were bare knuckle boxing. Wow. That makes a lot of sense. Yes, it does. Mm-hmm. All righty. Question four with deference to Bob Hoskins. The instant cinema classic Who Framed Roger Rabbit featured a wide array of cartoon characters from multiple copyright holders like Disney, Warner Brothers, MGM, King Features, and more. But what studio actually made the film? Okay, yeah, if you're okay with that, Nicole, uh, we can lock in there. I am more than okay with it. Okay. I think it's Disney, and then Jeff filled me in with an okay. So I think I think that that's all the confidence I need for us to go with Disney. So we're going to lock in with Disney. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, this one was kind of famous because Steven Spielberg uh, executive produced it for Robert Zemeckis. And there was so many different properties involved. Uh, it was like one of the bigger um, stories in Hollywood for a long time, just because of all these different um, rights issues that they, they had to get. And I believe... Um, I believe it was a, it was a touchstone movie, but touchstone is under Disney. So, uh, I, we locked in with, uh, with Disney. Well, it is a touchstone picture because touchstone, you're right, is a wing of Disney. It handles the less, uh, kitty friendly content. And I would also have accepted Amblin entertainment because they're listed as uh, one of the producing studios because, uh, Spielberg was involved. Now, um, I'll leave it up to the group at large how we want to score that particular one. I tend to be a little anal retentive. We're just going to give uh, zero points to both teams on that, uh, with the answer being Touchstones, uh, which was a distribution studio and label of Walt Disney. Um, but uh, more specifically, uh, I believe Moxie was looking for Touchstone only. So that was the, the answer. Okay. Right. Well, this cool. next one hopefully will be a little bit more fun. Question five, where's the beef? According to an urban legend that began in the 1970s, what does McDonald's use as filler in their hamburgers, allegedly? Okay, we can lock in. I I have no idea, Nicole. I don't know why antifreeze is, is coming to me. That seems so <laughs> random. Um, <laughs> That's how they make wine. Um, so Maybe it's like bugs, like ants or grasshoppers or something oh, gross like, to, like that to throw in the protein that the burgers didn't have true 
Um, that's that's interesting. Yeah. So um, what would so maybe the grossest arguably meat would it be like a cockroach? Maybe you know maybe like worms. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's arguably meat. Yeah, it's arguably meat. It I've heard I've heard of eating them, but it sounds like a disgusting meaty filler for burgers. Yeah, yeah, that's fine with me. This actually reminded me of uh, I just watched Snowpiercer and uh, they their protein patties are made from like grasshoppers or whatever something gross. Um, but I think I think this is worms, so we locked in with worms. In the 1970s, and even persisting now, some people believe that McDonald's stretches out their beef with ground up worms. Wow! So good, good going, everybody. All right, great job, Nicole. I know that was that was great line of thinking there. And I believe after five, it looks like uh, team, I forget the full name, but Scratchy Goatee, Audible Scratchy Goatee has 20, and uh, we have 30 at Blinkers Off, I believe. All righty. Question six. There may have been some cheating. From as early as the 1956 game show What's My Line to a 2018 episode of American Dad, the Harlem Globetrotters basketball team has guest starred on many TV shows. What classic sitcom did they do a made-for-TV movie special with, which is especially bizarre given the show's setting? So I, I'll, I'll um, lock in. I, I messaged an idea to Nicole, and they said that uh, they agreed. So I think we're locked in officially. Okay. Um, so I sent Jeff Gilligan's Island because it would be – strange for them to be one be able to find it and why didn't they take them back there's a lot of questions it actually raises <laughs> and i don't know if they go into it because i never saw the movie um but i think we're gonna lock in with that and say gilligan's island uh yes i every, anytime i think of the globe trotters and cameos i always remember they were on scooby-doo um they might have even been on batman but i i know for a fact there was like a famous episode when they were on scooby-doo um but i from hearing the clue of the setting, um, we also went Gilligan's Island. The Harlem Globetrotters joined the movie star Professor and Marianne on Gilligan's Island. Oh, That's no. so weird. Yeah, it pretty much was. <laughs> All righty. Question seven. If you see him, it's too late. The White Death was the nickname of a famously successful World War II sniper from what country? You know, it's it's funny. We've had a few sniper questions um, before, and I've never heard this one. So um, Nicole is texting some great possibilities. We are, we're locked in. You're locked yeah, in. Yeah, I feel like I feel like this has maybe come up in the context of something Ken was talking about once or twice. So, is there a movie about it? Then you would know. Not that I know of. No. Uh, if there's not, there should be. So yeah. you're locked in. You said. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, Nicole, you said possibly Finland and Russia, right? Yeah, Finland and Russia were the two countries that came to mind. And for some reason, I like I, I'm trying I'm trying to think through the trying to think through what I've read. I think I'm not sure if Russia came to mind because of a sniper or because I was listening to a podcast about, you know, maybe a I think like a like a flying ace or something from there. But the one that the one that came in and hit me really hard for some reason is Finland. I think there was a really good Finnish sniper who, and white death sounds right. Like I, I, I wish I could explain it better, but I, if I, if you're leaning on me, I have to go Finland. Yeah, I, I agree. I, um, I like, where your head is at because i i think we had an episode once where we talked about someone from russia called lady death maybe or something like that um and i've never heard of white death and it makes total sense to be finland so i'm totally 100 percent behind you if you'd like to go with that all right then let's lock in with finland it's funny because we had very, very similar uh discussion just in you know two lines instead of lots of talking but i said russia <laughs> he said you know it might be finland I thought this might be where the in Mortal Kombat when you get to the end and he says finish him. I think that's true. <laughs> so we said Finland. I think, yeah, I was to say I think this was during the the Winter War because Ken always likes to talk about how Finland just absolutely hands Russia their backside while they tried to invade them in World War II. So yeah, he loves Finland. That's true. He, he does. <laughs> so we said Finland. 
Well, the White Death, real name Simo Haya, dominated the Winter War for Finland. Wow, <laughs> right. great job. Excellent. See, Simo Haya would have made it a lot easier. There would have been etymology to get there instead of hand wringing. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. I want to know what our sniper names would be. I'm really curious. I don't know what mine would be. My old AOL screen name, probably Nighthawk. That would be mine for no reason other than it was my (laughs) AOL screen name. (laughs) Okay, question eight. What could possibly go wrong? Henry Ford tried and failed to set up a rubber plantation and company town called Fordlandia in what South American country? Mm. This is your favorite Fred Armisen show right now. Matt, I'm pretty sure I got this. man. (laughs) I wanted to make a Fred Armisen joke. (laughs) You got it. You're good with this, Jeff? Yeah, we can lock in. Oh, wow. All right. Jeff, um, sticking his chest out there. Um, Big Ford guy. Fordlandia. Um, Do you know anywhere that they they create rubber, Nicole? Uh, What's frustrating is I remember reading something about Fordlandia a year or two ago. I know this was a thing, and I cannot remember what country it was in. Two that keep popping into my mind, and I don't know why, are Colombia and Ecuador. Mm -hmm. Let's go with Colombia. Okay. I'm pretty sure that this was in the deep rainforest, but I remember specifically it was in Brazil that uh, Ford had Fordlandia. So we locked in with Brazil. Well, if you listen to your brain on Vex, you would know that Ford tried to set up a company town in a country that shares its name with an alarmingly prescient Terry Gilliam film, Brazil. Oh. Mm, right. Uh, Jeff did send me the sister cities of Chevy Town and Dodgeville, which I enjoyed very much. So, What about Flavortown? There's a petition to rename Columbus, Ohio to Flavortown. Did I send you that? Yeah. I would definitely sign it. I petition. signed it. <laughs> I, I'm a big fan of flame shirts and frosted tips. So. That's oh, what... and wearing sunglasses upside down on the back of your head. Yeah, That's what you're it's wearing real... right now. No one can see it except <laughs> Nicole and Moxie, but you're, you're wearing uh, a flame shirt and golden tips. <laughs> Always. All righty. Question nine. And you thought the paparazzi was bad. What real-life God-level rapper found himself dodging machine gun fire in a special edition Punisher comic in 2009? Okay, we are locked in over here. You guys, you can talk. Eminem had a song called Rap God, which is why I said Oh, yeah, Eminem. no, that makes sense. Yeah, he would um, be much more famous than Charlemagne the God. Charlemagne the God is a good guess as well. I don't know. Um, with that clue, I think, are you okay with going with Eminem? Yeah, no, Rap God makes sense um, mm-hmm. for the clue there. So I, I forgot about that song. So Okay, we can lock in with Eminem. Uh, yeah, I had the same clue. Um uh, the God level um, Eminem sang or rapped uh, rap God. And I'm not sure if I've ever seen this cover. Um, I'm interested now to see it, but um, yeah, we're going to go with uh, Eminem. All righty. Well, he was a big fan of the Punisher, the rap God himself, Eminem. All right. All right. Now, see, now I have to, that's two comic covers I have to look at now and which I'm excited about. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I figured we're mashing up our shows. So we might mm-hmm. as well do, do mashup type questions. All right, more mashups. Yeah, question 10. My stomach is a citizen of the world. What type of pizza was created by a Greek man in Canada and is the most popular kind in Australia? Yeah, I think that that's what's on, and I think it could be what the name is, but I think we'll just go. I'm pretty sure I've heard that somewhere. Okay. Locked in. Nicole, you said... Hawaiian pizza was invented in Canada. Yeah, I remember hearing like recently, just within the last week or two, that Hawaiian pizza was invented in Canada, which is the only hook I have. I don't know what kind of pizza is popular in Australia. I don't know if the inventor of Hawaiian pizza was Greek, but in one of those unending arguments about whether pineapple belongs on pizza, which it does, by the way. It does, yeah. (laughs) I remember hearing that Hawaiian pizza was a started in Canada. Let's let's go with it. I trust you. Let's go with Hawaiian pizza. Yeah, it's surprising that it'd be that popular in Australia without any Vegemite on it. But I think we are going to agree and say Hawaiian pizza. 
All right, well, here is a bonus fact for you in the answer. To avoid having to make a sequel to Beetlejuice, Tim Burton gave the studio a script entitled Beetlejuice Goes Hawaiian. Oh, all right. I did know that. I've heard that before. That's really weird. (laughs) That That is really weird. After the first round, it looks like these scores are very close, 70 to 70. Uh, And before we go to the swing round, just want to remind everyone to join us over at The Crop, uh, where you can interact with other listeners, uh, talk about the episodes. We'll have some news there, um, sign-up forms, things like that. And we'd love to to have you join us over there, uh, as well as our social media, which you can find us at Triviality Pod on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and all that, um, and come uh, hang out over there. So uh, please join us and interact as much as possible. Uh, so Moxie, what do you have in store for us today as far as the swing round? Today's swing round is protest songs. I am going to give you the artist and the incident, and you need to come up with the song. One, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young and the Kent State Massacre. Two, the Plastic Ono Ban and the Vietnam War. Three, Rage Against the Machine and the acquittal of the cops who beat Rodney King. Four, Woody Guthrie and the inherent inequality of property ownership. I promise that one's not as bad as it sounds. Five, Kendrick Lamar and the murders of Michael Brown and Tamar Rice. Six, the Sex Pistols and Queen Elizabeth's Silver Jubilee. Seven, the Smiths and the Chernobyl disaster. Eight, Barry McGuire and the Cuban Missile Crisis. Nine, Buffalo Springfield and the Vietnam War. And I do insist on the correct title for this one. And number 10, U2 and the Troubles. All right, we are going to talk about those clues and be back with our answers. All the answers are now locked in. Let's go back to Moxie for the questions and we will give our answers. Okay, so you were given an artist and an incident and had to come up with the protest or reaction song that they performed because of it. Question one, CSNY and the Kent State Massacre. I had all kinds of facts about how Crosby, Stills, and Nash had all been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame twice in different bands, but I couldn't think of a song they did about Kent State, neither could Neil, so we had to tap out on that one. Yeah, actually, I um, my uh, high school English teacher, one of them, um, shout out to Mrs. Grady, uh, she was attending Kent State for her master's at the time of the incident, and Crosby, Seals, Nash was always one of my favorite bands, so I happen to know that this is Ohio. Mm-hmm. This summer, you'll hear the drumming, Four Dead in Ohio. All righty. Number two was the Plastic Ono Band and the Vietnam War. This one, uh, I was trying to think of um, what it could be, and initially I was saying, oh, that can't be Yoko Ono's group. Maybe it's a trick question. Um, Nicole uh, said it was, and I said, well, um, then I think it's got to be Give Peace a Chance, because that's the only one I know. So that's what we locked in with. And we decided we didn't know anything about this very early on and did not have an answer. Well, all we are saying is Give Peace a Chance. Number three... Rage Against the Machine, and the acquittal of the cops who beat Rodney King. Well, there are a lot of good Rage Against the Machine songs. The only one specifically that I could think of that... The only one I could think of off the top of my head with a reference to cops was one that says some of those who work forces are the same that burn crosses. So we said killing in the name. Pretty much any Rage Against the Machine song is probably a protest song at some level. Uh, We said killing in the name. Yep, it took some doing to find a specific uh, causative event, but yep, it was killing in the name. So question four, Woody Guthrie and the inherent inequality of property ownership. This one, uh, through a little bit of discussion, um, we kind of uh, located uh, the fact that Woody Guthrie was folk and it had to do with property and uh, what other song is there than This Land is Your Land that made sense. So that's what we logged in with. Wow. That makes sense. Uh, we didn't have an answer, so something off the top of my head, I'll say burning down the house. It's about houses. <laughs> okay, well, this land was made for you and me. It is, this land is your land. It's one of those songs that I don't think of having an artist. It just existing. It just so exists, it's kind of yeah. Right. It's in every yeah. choir book. You always sing it. Yeah. Sing it in scouts, yep. the whole nine, yep. 
All righty. Number five, Kendrick Lamar and the murders of Michael Brown and Tamar Rice. This is one that Neil was right on top of, and it's all right. Yeah, we think this is all right. Well, it's all right with me. It is all right. Number six, the Sex Pistols and Queen Elizabeth's Silver Jubilee. Nicole uh, was right on the money with this one. Uh, I was not thinking, apparently. Uh, and they said, God save the Queen. And I said, that sounds exactly right. So that's what we locked in with. We I was going to say, I think we just forgot to write this one down. <laughs> Either way. Well, may the sun never set on her empire. It was God save the Queen. Number seven, the Smiths and the Chernobyl disaster. Well, we were coming up with a complete lack of Smiths songs. Definitely nothing that sounded like a protest song. But since it was the one Smith song we could actually think of, we said, how soon is now? Yeah, we did not have one for this. We couldn't think of any Smith songs. Well, you actually heard this song used in the, uh, the same film from which one of today's team names comes from. The song was Panic. Oh. One that goes panic in the streets of London. Number eight. And yes, this was a hard one. Barry Maguire and the Cuban Missile Crisis. We were not sure on this one. Uh, I'd, I'd never heard of Barry Maguire. Um, and um, we, we just didn't have a good guess. So I'm, I'm excited to learn more about it. But uh, we just had a tap on this one. Um, so we had nothing. All righty. Do check this out on YouTube. And it has been covered a few times. The song was Eve of Destruction. <sighs> Number nine, Buffalo Springfield and the Vietnam War. Neil and I tried and just couldn't land on a Buffalo Springfield song, so we've got to pass. Well, um, for what it's worth, this one is a little tricky because I don't think the lyrics are actually said in the song, but uh, the song starts, there's something happening here, and that's for what it's worth. Well, Buffalo Springfield, who uh, can claim both Neil Young and Stephen Stills, Stop, children, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down. Yeah, they never say for what it's worth, but that is the title of the song. Oh. I did, see, I, I thought Buffalo... That, I'm, I'm such an idiot. I'm sorry, Nicole. I thought Buffalo Springs, Springfield was a person, just like Rick Springfield, but I was incorrect. All righty. Number, and number 10, You Two and The Troubles. Uh, this one um, we had discussed a little bit, and I knew uh, Sunday Bloody Sunday was... Um, a song based on events uh, or a protest, and I figured that it fit. So we went with Sunday Bloody Sunday. And we also went with Sunday Bloody Sunday. And you're all very smart people. It was Sunday Bloody Sunday. All right. After the swing round, it looks like uh, the scores are still very, very close. Uh, team Scratchy, Goatee, Beards, et cetera, et cetera, is what I'm going to call it. Um, picked up 25 points, and Team Blinkers Off picked up 30 points, bringing our totals to 95 to 100. So let's jump into the second round. All righty, super close game going into round two. Question one. If I could walk that way, I wouldn't need the doctor. Aerosmith helped introduce wide audiences to hip-hop by collaborating with Run DMC to cover their own song, Walk This Way. What album was the song originally on? along with Sweet Emotion and the title track. All right. Uh, Nicole, any um, Aerosmith knowledge? Uh, not really. I think this album was pretty early in their career, and 70s music is not one of my wheelhouses. Aerosmith, um, I always mix up what famous songs were on certain al albums of theirs, because I know they had like a self-titled album um, just called Aerosmith, I think. Uh, and I there's another one that... It's like a kid... It's not a kid album, but it sounds like a kid album. Um, I think they had a song called like Toys. We could go Toys. I don't know if that... I knew it had something to do with kids. So maybe it, if the song is called Toys, like the uh, uh, Ron Williams movie. I don't know. Sure. Let's go with Toys. Okay. Works for me. <laughs> oh, you're so close to backing yourself into an answer again, but you didn't. Jack, what is it? Yeah. Um, it is Toys in the Attic. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no you were cigar. definitely very close, but it was toys in the attic. Hey, Neil, do you know what kind of pisses me off is um, on big ones, big 10 inch record is not on that album. <laughs> oh, yeah, that. Yeah, you think it would be. Yeah. Question two. Apple of my eye. The term calipigian and steatopigian refer to the size and shape of what body part? 
Awesome. Uh, we're going to lock in. Yeah. Maybe it's like the thumb or something with fingers. Okay. Sounds like it. I, I feel like I've heard it before in sports maybe. So I think it has some, maybe it had something to do with like wingspan or something like that. But um, I feel like I'd heard it before in that realm. Um, so uh, you want to say maybe like hands or... I mean, you've had inklings on other things today, so I'm just going to let you run with it. Okay, we'll say hand length. All right, which is very fitting with horse, with horses, the hand, right? Isn't that... Uh... Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Four, four inches, the hand, that's how you measure a horse is how many hands tall they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nicole knows the answer to this one, uh, so I'll let them answer. Well, I have heard people talk about Sir mix love of Calipigian women, so we said butts. Well, actually, he loves Steatopigian women. Because both of those terms refer to the size and shape, usually of the female buttock. Oh, maybe I so. Haven't yes, heard it is the buttocks. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Calipigian means shapely. There is actually a uh, temple to Aphrodite Calipigia, mm. and uh, Steatopigia refers to an abnormal uh, excess of fatty tissue on the derriere. Mm. And then I know a burlesque da- uh, burlesque dancer whose stage name is Cali Pigeon. And I like high fived her. I'm like, I don't care if nobody else ever gets it. I got it. <laughs> that is a great name. Mm-hmm. All righty. Question number three to serve man. What cannibal is a University of Colorado dining room named after? From the sound of this silence, uh, our cannibal knowledge does not seem like it's very strong. Yeah, not as strong as you thought it was. Mm-hmm. If it was about cannibal corpse, maybe. Nicole, I like the, the Thomas Harris angle there. Um, yeah, I don't think, unless it were some really far back in the day historical figure, like I doubt they'd name him after a recent real cannibal. Right. So maybe either Thomas Harris, who wrote the, you know, the Hannibal Lecter books, or perhaps maybe one of the actors like Anthony Hopkins maybe went there. I Whatever you think, Nicole, because I... I don't know how cutesy the the actual answer is if it's if it's clever or if it's just maybe it was a mistake that they named it after you know uh, an actual cannibal, but I don't know. I mean, I think it would be kind of tasteless no matter what, but I still think no pun intended, right? I was like, you've never <laughs> you've never eaten a person, then have you? <laughs> no, I haven't. Uh, I haven't dabbled in cannibalism yet. Mm. I'm sorry. It's a bit gamey. <laughs> um, do you want to go Hannibal Lecter? I know game. it's fictional, but. What do, what do you think? Yeah, I think I still like Hannibal Lecter better than anything else we've come up with. So let's go with Hannibal Lecter. Sounds good to me. I think they got caught in the Sierra Nevadas, but we were still thinking it might be the Donner Party because honestly, the Donner Diner sounds pretty good. Yeah, that does have good alliteration and it rhymes. And uh, people getting trapped in the mountains was involved. The judge that uh, sentenced him said there were seven Democrats in Hinsdale County and you ate five of them. Damn you, Alfred Packer. Huh. Is the Alfred Packer grill. Huh. Um, Okay. Question four. Bring your husband to work day. What professional role did the wives of Alfred Hitchcock and George Lucas fill in their husband's most famous movies? Oh, we're locked in. You're locked in? Um, okay. So I know for a fact that George Lucas's wife, um, was an editor. Um, and I I think she even did editing on, uh, on Jaws for Steven Spielberg. But, um, so that for sure I know is editor Hitchcock's wife, uh, was named Alma, I believe. And she was a really great screenwriter, but perhaps she was also an editor because if, if I know George Lucas's wife was an editor, um, then that would have to, and, uh, with, uh, Marsha Lucas. So if she was an editor, Alma probably was screenwriter and editor. Cause I know she was a great screenwriter. So are you okay with maybe just going editor? Yeah. Especially if you know that George Lucas's wife did not actually write those movies, right. then yeah, I'm happy to go. I'm happy to go with that. Okay. All right. So we were going to, uh, we will lock in with editor. That's a, that's a pretty, Good guess, I would think. Um, I thought it might be something 
where it'd be a person that they'd want to have around with them quite a bit. And that would be someone, something that the script supervisor does. So uh, we locked in with script supervisor. Well, of the, uh, the two Lucases involved with Star Wars, the Oscar went to Marsha Lucas and two colleagues for best editing. Mm. And yes, Hitchcock's wife's name was uh, Alma Revel. She was the one who had the idea to have the staccato strings in Psycho. And Marsha Lucas absolutely saved A New Hope and made the Star Wars franchise possible because George Lucas's version of it sucked and was terrible. There are side-by-side comparisons available on YouTube. Check it out. He's yeah, not good. It was bad. There was a... Uh... It looks really bad. They, I saw like a for a clip of like an early run of it or whatever. It was bad. Yes, yeah, slow and plotting, and characters are introduced at the wrong times, and there's no suspense. And it was Marshall Lucas's idea for uh, Obi Wan Kenobi to die. Spoiler alert. Yeah, there's a there's a, a number of um, wonderful female editors in history that are often overlooked uh, for some reason, uh, and they shouldn't be. Anne V. Coates for one, uh, you know, famous for Lawrence of Arabia and Thelma Sch- uh, Schoonmaker. Um, just so many wonderful editors that are um, sort of the saving grace behind some filmmakers uh, who, if left to their own devices, um, would not make as strong a product, just like you just said with George. So, Yeah. Question number five. When you're really sure of your hypothesis. In 1898, a German doctor hit, stabbed, hammered, and even burned his assistant to successfully test what now illegal substance as an anesthetic? Okay, you're locked in, you said? Yeah. Okay. Um, Nicole and I were talking about uh, possibly heroin. Um, I know, I guess before it was opium, or at least part of heroin was opium. And um, Oh, I mean, by, 18, by 1898, I believe heroin qua heroin was a thing. It was, okay. I, guess, I mean, I guess we could go heroin um it, I, I can't think of another drug off the top of my head or substance um but i, I mean heroin Her- kind of makes you numb so maybe that's where it came from i don't know heroin is currently illegal and it is a high grade mm. painkiller yeah let's go with it yeah let's go with heroin all right and um yeah we i think we're along the same lines we thought uh it's probably uh it's what well, we definitely know it's illegal but uh, we figured it also might be a good painkiller so we said heroin well your thinking was correct the reasoning was correct but the actual drug i'm afraid was not it was cocaine oh Mm. wow Mm -hmm. it was cocaine which they dissolved and uh injected into the spine similar to an epidural and it it prevented the assistant from feeling any of the things that were happening which is good because uh the testing also included yanking out pubic hair and squashing his testicles oh my god my god the next day however (laughs) When it wore off, he was not in as good a shape. Yeah. Sounds like they were both on cocaine then, just <laughs> administered differently. Well, everybody everybody was back then. But uh. we'll see. Initially, they had tried it on the doctor, but the um, assistant didn't do the stick right. The, doc- the doctor got some of it. And so they were beating, they were both beating, e- they were beating each other up. The assistant got the worst of it because he got the most coverage from the drug. The next day, the doctor calls out of work, so the assistant has to not only go into work himself, he has to cover for the doctor. <laughs> they had a falling out shortly thereafter. Yeah, can't <laughs> imagine. That's a very good working relationship. Yeah, yeah, we're not. That gonna... sounds like the weirdest coke fueled medical brawl ever. <laughs> I would like to see a list of the other coke fueled medical brawls as soon as possible, please. <laughs> that is that, that is right for a uh, for an HBO miniseries. Okay. Question number six. Now the doc says, what's up? What famous cartoon voice actor was brought partially out of a coma following a car accident by doctors talking to the characters that he voiced? Yeah, we're locked in. I think it's right. Okay. Uh, I'll let you take it, Nicole. I think we're on the same page, actually. It was was good timing. I think it's Mel Blanc. Uh, Yeah, we think that it's uh, the voice of Bugs Bunny himself, Mel Blanc. It was indeed. Uh, one of his doctors said, how are you doing today, Bugs? And without regaining full consciousness, Mel Blank responded as Bug, Bugs Bunny. And they found that for whatever reason, they were able to communicate with the characters, even though if they addressed Mel himself, he wasn't able to respond. That's all those characters stuck in his subconscious, just waiting yeah. to come out. Alrighty. Question number seven. Better than brown M&Ms. 
which Hollywood tough guy action star will only play bad guys if the character dies or goes to jail, i.e. suffers the consequences for their life of crime? And I will, I will toss out a clue. This particular actor is a lot shorter than you think he is. It's not Tom Cruise. Oh, man. I was just going to say Tom <laughs> Cruise. No. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we're going to lock in. I think we're, we feel pretty good about this. You know, no, Sly, he is short. Yeah, but it's, it's fine. Fine. We're locking with Sly Stallone. Okay. Um, so initially you, you think of, you know, Sly Stallone. He's, he's fairly uh, short. Um, Moxie said it wasn't Tom Cruise. Um, there is a person, an actor, who uh, often plays um, baddies, I guess you could say. And uh, they actually were in jail before in their career. And uh, Nicole even uh, agreed that uh, possibly due to his uh, incarceration, maybe that's why um, he doesn't um, he doesn't play bad guys that don't, I guess, get their comeuppance. So um, we went with Danny Trejo. He's played the same type of character so many times. He'll turn on the TV and see himself in a movie he has no recollection of filming. It is Danny Trejo. Wow. Nice. That's a good call. Um, Great call, Neil. All right. Question number eight. Eat your fingers. In Japan, what American fast food restaurant requires reservations months in advance if you want to eat there on Christmas Day? Matt, I got this. Yeah, we can lock in. Oh, wow. Are we looking at a um, American fast food restaurant that does something for Christmas, possibly? Or do you think that's just uh, part of the, the story? It doesn't really have much to do with it. We don't do this here. Oh, we don't. I'll tell you that much. Okay. Yeah, I'm surprised I don't know this, too. Like, this does not ring a bell and it's weird that me and jeff are like oh yeah i know that um <laughs> like right well away. shout out to ken who Just likes japan who likes japan no actually i know this for a few reasons i've got a few friends who um who are big fans of japan just not ken so <laughs> there's more i just really wanted to tell people that i have more than one friend okay it's on record Maybe it's possible that it's KFC. Um, I don't think it's White Castle. I just know White Castle does the Valentine's Day dinner you can yeah. do. When I think of American fast food restaurant that exists in Japan, I mean, you've you've hit the two that come to mind for me, which is to say McDonald's and KFC. Uh, I'm good with whatever you think, Nicole. Which one are you leaning towards? I have a little stronger association with Japan and KFC, so let's go KFC. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I believe there was a eating your fingers clue in there and they were finger licking good chicken, oh. I believe is their slogan. Uh, but it's KFC. Yep. When they, uh, brought the company over to China, the slogan was mistranslated as eat your fingers off. Mm. And it is a Christmas day staple to go to KFC. Alrighty. Question number nine. How would a centaur wear pants? Like the Greek chimera. The Egyptian goddess Amut is a combination of three animals, two semi-aquatic animals, the hippo and the crocodile, and what fully land-based animal? We're good, Matt. Okay. You can I literally thank my plank of Magic the Gathering for this. My brain didn't function fast enough, and I really thought the question was how would a centaur wear pants? I was I like, know. wait. <laughs> Mo- <laughs> really- Moxie got me good I on that know. one. I was really deep, deep thinking about that, uh, how the pants would go on. Because of the Sphinx, I just I have an association with Egypt and felines like lions and cats. Mm -hmm. I'm good with that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's go with lion. I'm not sure we're going to get to anything better or or actually think of anything and be like, yes, that's exactly it. If neither of us have actually heard of this Amit character. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So lion. Yep. Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure from my knowledge of Magic the Gathering that uh, this is a lion. Yep, the Egyptian goddess Amut is made up of parts of hippo, crocodile, and lion. It's a ferocious beast. Moving on to our final question of the day. Question number 10, blast from the past. Space Jam mashed up real sports with classic cartoons and a now legendary actor who was in a slump in his career. Most interestingly of all, though, is the fact that the movie's original website is still up untouched. What year did the site go up? Um, we can lock in. Uh, so, Nicole, I think the website would correspond with the 
film's release date, and I I believe it was released 96 or 97. Just want to go with 96? That's good with me. Yeah. Yeah. 1996. Yeah, this movie. If the if it if the website started the same year as the movie, the movie came out on my 11th birthday, and I was really excited. And I saw it in the theater um, in 1996. So we said 1996. Well, there's no way you're going to forget the movie you went to see on your 11th birthday. The Space Jam website went up in 1996. Ooh, nice. Okay, after regulation, it looks like going into the final round, scores are going to be 145 for Scratchy, Beard, etc., etc., Incorporated, and 170 for Blinkers Off. So uh, let's hear those final round categories, Moxie, to uh, give our wagers. All righty. The categories for the last round, this will be a round of famous lasts. So not famous first, famous lasts. Categories are last words, Last of its kind, last flight, last emperor, and last on the moon. All the wagers are locked in, so let's hear those categories one more time and the questions, Moxie. Question one. What were the last words of Giles Corey, a man who was crushed to death under stones in an attempt to make him enter a plea during the infamous Salem witch trials? Alrighty, question two. What model of aircraft made its final commercial flight on October 24th, 2003? Question number three. A lone specimen, nicknamed Benjamin, was captured in 1933 and died in 1936 because his keeper forgot to put him away for the night, marking the extinction of what species? Question four. Who was the last adult pharaoh of egypt so that would be someone over the age of 18 who was the last adult pharaoh of egypt and number five leaving with the message we leave as we came and god willing we shall return with peace and hope for all mankind astronaut eugene cernan was the last man to walk on the moon in what year okay we're going to talk about these questions and be right back with our answers Okay, all of the answers are now locked in. Before we throw it back to Moxie, just wanted to say a very special thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. If you'd like to join them, you can go to patreon.com slash trivialitypodcast to pick up many different perks like posters, character boxes, uh, and extra audio content uh, where we're a little bit more unfiltered. So if you'd like to join all of our supporters to help keep the show going, you can go to patreon.com slash trivialitypodcast. And back to you, Moxie. Question one was, what were the last words of Giles Corey, who was crushed to death under stones in an attempt to make him enter a plea during the infamous Salem witch trials? So here at Blinkers Off, we are going to wager uh, five all the way down, Oakland fives, because we wanted to be a little bit uh, more conservative. Uh, So for our first answer... Uh, I was telling Nicole that um, I uh, know a lot about Salem witch trial history, um, and I'm what's really hitting me over the head uh, is uh, the phrase more weight or put more weight on, on because uh, Giles did not want to give up any information. So um, we're going with uh, more weight. Um, we wagered a 20 for every single uh, question. And yeah, I think uh, the answer was more weight. He wasn't going to give him the satisfaction. Giles Corey's, Giles Corey's last words repeated over the course of three days were more weight. Question number two. What model of aircraft made its final commercial flight on October 24th, 2003? I had a pretty good feeling about this one. I remember there being periodic commercial flights with the Concorde throughout my childhood. Um, But sometime... Not too far from 2003, at least. They just kind of stopped. Um, so, yeah, I went with the Concorde. Still wagering 20. Uh, we said Concorde jet. Costing as much as $50,000 a flight, being uncomfortably hot in the cabin and blowing out windows if it went over houses, it was the Concorde. So question number three. A lone specimen nicknamed Benjamin was captured in 1933 and died in 1936 because his keeper didn't put him away for the night, marking the extinction of what species? I could really only think of one species that went extinct during the first half of the 20th century, and I'm not sure it was quite as late as the 30s, but still we went with passenger pigeon. 
we're on the same page there. Also said passenger pigeon. Well, the very last passenger pigeon, whose name was Martha, uh, died in 1914. 1936 saw the end of the thylacine, or Tasmanian tiger. Mm. Question number four. Who was the last adult pharaoh of Egypt? Egyptian history, not one of my strong points. I could only think of two names of pharaohs, one of which was Tutankhamun, and the only other name I could think of was Akhenaten. So that's what we went with, Akhenaten. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. The only one I could think of was the Scorpion King, so we went with Dwayne Johnson. (laughs) (laughs) All righty. This was, in fact, Cleopatra VII. Mm -hmm. Ah, don't forget, never forget the Ptolemy dynasty. All right, now question number five. We leave as we came, and God willing, we shall return with peace and hope for all mankind, were the words of astronaut Eugene Cernan, the last man to walk on the moon in what year? This one uh, we were also unsure of. Uh, both of our uh, space knowledge is not great, uh, which is why on the show I always defer to Jeff. Uh, so we knew it possibly was in the 70s, uh, and for lack of a, a better reason, um, I said Jaws was released in 1975, uh, and let's just go in the middle of the decade. So we went with 1975. Yeah, my space knowledge generally ends at Space Jam, but luckily Jeff's on my team, uh, and he's pretty confident in 1973, so we said 1973. Well, one of you is going to be a little more annoyed than the other one. It was 1972. Oh, oh. Uh, well, I believe after the the scores there, um, it looks like um, Blinkers Off uh, lost five, and I believe you lost 20 after all the wagering there. So the final score should be uh, Team Scratchy, Goatee, Inaudible, Subtitle, Incorporated, et cetera, et cetera, with 125, and Blinkers Off with 165, and today's Cream of the Crop. I am the queen. Ooh, yay. Yay. Great job, Nicole. Thank you. That was a great game. Great job, everyone. And what a wonderfully written game, too, Moxie. Thank you so much for putting this game together. Oh, thank you. I'm really glad to have done it. It was every single question I had looked at and agonized over, is this too easy or is this too hard? Because none of them ever felt like the right degree of difficulty. (laughs) No, it was a lot. It was a really fun game to play, Moxie. Thank you. And as as far as... As far as difficulty, I think the difficulty was great. There are Mm -hmm. questions we knew and questions we didn't, and it was fun to play, so it's good. Yeah, it allowed us to work together and uh, use our strengths and and, uh, put them together. Um, Moxie, especially all the extra facts that you threw in there were wonderful. So where where can people learn more about you, your podcast, uh, buy your book, uh, and just in general become fans like we are now? Well, we've got the central point of information over at yourbrainonfacts.com, Facebook and Instagram, uh, slash your brain on facts. Twitter is brain on facts pod because God forbid Twitter give us enough letters. You, I, in terms of getting the book, I recommend contacting your local bookseller safely, of course, because they need your love now more than ever. You can order through bookshop.org, which is like a central clearinghouse for indie bookstores. And failing that, it is, of course, on Amazon. And it is called Your Brain on Facts Things You Didn't Know, Things You Thought You Knew, and Things You Never Knew, You Never Knew. The title takes up most of the front cover. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. Uh, well, thank you again for joining us and for putting this game together. Well, thank you for letting me do it. Of course. Uh, well, you're welcome back anytime. Uh, and Nicole, uh, there's many different sites people can uh, can find you at, whether it's on Twitter or uh, at your website. But um, tell us a little bit more about where people can interact with you. Oh, thank you. I'm all over the internet, really. You can find me on Twitter at Rogue Clown, R O G U E C L O W N. You can find me on my website at blinkers off.com. You can also find my podcast, Chicago Race of the Day, where I talk about one race every day of thoroughbred horse racing in Chicago. Or right now, since there is no thoroughbred horse racing in Chicago, I'm doing races at the downstate track Fairmont Park just outside of St. Louis on the Illinois side. You can find that really anywhere where you can find podcasts. So you can find it on Google, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, any of those, or on my website, blinkers-off.com. It's called Chicago Race of the Day. Wonderful. Well, uh, you were a wonderful uh, teammate. uh, And hopefully when we're able to stop social distancing, perhaps you will come out and we'll have Matt and Jeff do a foot race that you can podcast about and see how well they do. Excellent. I am looking forward to it once we're not all locked down in our houses. 
Awesome. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, to Moxie and Nicole, uh, Matt and Jeff. Thank you for joining us as always. Ken is uh, still squeezing almonds, I believe. So if you want to support him, uh, eat some more almond butter. Uh, you, it might have been squeezed by Ken. You never know. Uh, but my name is Neil and that was Triviality. You can check us out on facebook.com. You know, oh my God, I can't talk today. Do you want me to do it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Facebook.com. You heard of it? What the? I'll, I'll start here. Okay. <laughs> Type Facebook into your Google. Yeah. I don't know what I'm doing.